Okay, it is four o'clock, so I think we should start. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bea Lefkowitz, and I'm the director of the AJR Refugee Voices Archive. So just to warn you, we are recording this event today, so if you don't want to be filmed, please switch off your cameras. Um, there will be time for questions. Also, you can put them in the chat, and I will read them out to Hella. Uh, and if it's also very pressing and you would like to talk, just wave and we'll try to find you and you'll have a possibility to ask your question. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this AJR Book Club with Hella Pick today, whose new memoir, Invisible Walls, was just published by Weidenfeld. Congratulations, Hella, to the publication of your new book. It was reviewed last week in the Financial Times, the Jewish Chronicle, the Observer and in the Guardian today. Undoubtedly, there will be a lot of publicity in the next few weeks, and we are very lucky to have you here with us today. Ella Pick will be known to many of you. She was born on the 24th of April, 1929 in Vienna. She grew up in the 19th Bezirk with her mother and grandparents as her, her parents divorced when she was three years old. She has very few memories of growing up in Vienna. Her real memories start when she arrived in England. Um, after her her mother put Hella on a list for the kinder transport and Hella left Vienna in March 1939. Her mother managed to get a domestic visa three months later. After arriving in Liverpool Street, she was taken in by a Jewish family in London, the Infields, who had three children and sent her to a local school in Bronsbury. They wanted to adopt her, but when Hella's mother came, Hella wanted to be with her mother. This was not possible at first, but when her mother was employed by the Chorley family, she could join her mother in the Lake District where she remained throughout the war together with her mother. Um, following her studies at the LSE, Hella Pick became a pioneer among women journalists whose first job as a young journalist took her to West Africa in the late 1950s to cover the independence negotiations of the region's British and French colonies. Spending the next 35 years with The Guardian, Hella covered the world stage ranging from the Kennedy assass assassination to the Selma March in the US to the Cold War in Europe and to the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Willy Brandt was among the many friends she made among world leaders. Her international network widened and took her onto China where she moved on to work at George Weidenfeld's Institute of Strategic Dialogue. She has also written two highly acclaimed books, the first one Simon Wiesenthal, Life in Search of Justice, and the second one Guilty Victim, Austria from the Holocaust to Haida. She received a CBE in 2000 and has also been awarded high distinction by the Austrian and German governments. Hella, a lot has happened uh, in the world since I interviewed you in February 2019. And since I took you to find some of your own and your mother's document and, uh, at World Jewish Relief. And I'm very pleased that uh, one document made it to the cover um, of the book. Yes. Um, and which is, the, we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, you can see, I made a little film uh, about it and you can see this film on our website uh, of the encounter with Debbie, uh, Hella's encounter with Debbie Cantor from World Jewish Relief. So my first question to you is, what impact did that visit uh, to World Jewish Relief have on you? And what did it feel like to see things in black and white from a time you could not quite remember? And I think the number here on your book uh, here is four, your number of the kinder transport, 4672, you didn't know about and also the date of uh, your arrival. And did it change your own conceptions of your past? Well, first of all, it was really startling suddenly to see this file that I knew on it. I think just going to the Hello, we can't hear you very well. Move a little bit closer to the mic, please. Sorry, I'll move closer. Sorry, is this better? Better. Right, can you hear me better? I'm sorry. Anyway, what I wanted to say is I was totally astonished suddenly to discover a file that contained not just my number of kinder transport, but also to discover all sorts of small details that were marked there, all of which point to the um, shortage of money that we had throughout the war. My, my mother was all the time having to ask for some financial help so that I could go to school. And we were really very, very poor throughout that whole period. And this is marked in those documents because it showed how we were supported. So that was a wonderful discovery. 
then I also discovered the position of a small file on my mother herself and the contacts that she had with the refugee organizations. So all of this it was really so welcome because I had very, very little documentation myself. So to find this is a really spurred me on in the writing of the early chapters of this book. Thank you, Hela. Uh, some people are saying they can't hear you very well. So let's try and improve it. Let's move as close as you can, or maybe I'm, I'm, there's something- I'm practically on the computer. <laughs> is your mic, maybe, is there something in front of your mic? Try to free the microphone. There's absolutely nothing. I'm straight in front of my screen. Okay, okay. I think, I think it's 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 better now. Okay, okay. I, I can just see me close up. Don't worry, we need to hear you. That's our main aim. Now, now, can you hear me now? Much better. Um, no, it was a privilege, Hella, to go with you, and I think there are not many interviews where. You know, you do an interview and then afterwards you're able to see the documents. And even for me, I think it was very, very moving to find things. You know, even I, I remember very clearly that you didn't know exactly when you arrived in Britain. You thought it was April and then we found it was actually in March. Exactly. And I also haven't realized my mother came so soon after I left. But what did you it remember? It was really a very, very short space of time. And of course, what I discovered later was that she, in fact, could have come earlier than I did because being on her own, she could have come on domestic permit. The nurses would have let her go, but they wouldn't have let me go. She could only have come unaccompanied. So therefore, of course, the, um, the point never came up that she would, could, would have gone before and leave me behind. And in fact, as I discovered afterwards, she even hesitated to leave after I had come to England because her mother was in Prague and she wanted still to go to Prague to see if she could get her mother, my grandmother, out of Prague. But that in the end proved to be impossible. So that is when she decided to take up her visa to this. But, um, it was curious. I hadn't realized that I found an old pa her passport. I have, and I could see the various permits, exit permits that were in it. Saw that she actually postponed her departure, which is interesting <laughs> in retrospect. When was she? When was she supposed to come, and when did she come? Well, she, she. I mean, she, she could have had a, her a visa already. January of 39, but in fact, uh, she then came three months after I came. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ella. Before actually talking about the story itself, I wanted to, to ask you about the process of writing. Um, you've, of course, written other books about other people like Simon Wiesenthal. What was it like to write this book about yourself? And also, I have to say, I've just finished the book. You very bravely write about your personal struggles and your long term relationships. For example, with Narinda Singh, the then Deputy High Commissioner of India at the United Nations, and also sociologist and politician Lord Dahendorf. And what I'd like to know, at what point did you decide to share this personal side of your life? And do you feel it's important for prominent people like you to talk about their own struggles? Well, that was a very difficult decision. But um, when, I, when I decided, because I had been urged to write it, a memoir quite a long time, and I always said, No, I don't have enough to say, and I don't want to do it, and so on. Anyway, I was finally persuaded uh, to write a synopsis to see if I could sell the idea of publishing this memoir. And I then made up my mind that if I'm going to write, I've got to write something about my personal life uh, as well as my working life just to write about my professional life, I think would have been too boring <laughs> and I wanted to introduce something and also to explain myself better. Um, I think before I started writing, I hadn't realized just how it would work out. And in fact, uh, I did drop 
one more chapter, there would have been a, the plan was a third personal chapter. I, I decided I couldn't bring myself to do that anymore. But um, the two chapters that I wrote, um, well, you know, they don't really do a lot of sail off for me <laughs> because they're really stories of failure. But um, I just felt people should get a, a round vision of, of my life rather than just a, 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 just a professional from working politically. But uh, I don't know whether I've succeeded. I hope I've not offended anybody. I have been quite honest about it. I've been very careful about the way I wrote it. But, uh, and of course, you, you haven't mentioned there, there was one, one bit of my working life which uh, was great fun and took me completely out of my comfort zone, really, and that was to write a life with the Aga Khan. And I spent a year traveling the world with the Aga Khan and writing about him and discovering uh, both an interesting phenomenon and a very interesting personality. But the book was aborted in the end about Aga Khan. No, it was a chapter on the eye. Oh, the book itself. Oh, the book, the actual <laughs> book. I know, I, it's in your book. But <laughs> it was, wasn't cut out of the book, my book, but the book itself was aborted because uh, I explain in the book uh, more or less how that came about. It, not through, because I wrote a particularly bad book, but uh, all sorts of circumstances connected to the art card and the Israeli community and um, the but uh, yes, it was obviously it's very disappointing to spend over a year working on the book and, and writing it and getting it to publication. And then to find that it was not published, <laughs> it could probably be the first commission that um, um, we want to publish. Um, so, but I had a wonderful time for a year and I, I learned about. Uh, Muslim community, which is a fascinating liberal community, and uh, about a really interesting man who does enormously good work on development projects in all parts of the world. So it's, for me, it was an interesting experience, and also for the first time, took me to China, and that was in China, which was very different to the China of today, because it was a China on bicycles not on <laughs> and, uh, China in, in drab uniform. So uh, it was prehistoric China in terms of contemporary history. And which year, when was that? When were you there? With... Oh, that was in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Hela, tell us a little bit about the writing of the book. I mean, you wrote it partly in the pandemic and partly you had a sort of accident in the middle of the writing. Yes, uh, I mean, I decided that I would, I, unlike many more dedicated authors, I decided I would not start writing the book until I actually had a contract. And uh, I got the contract in, uh, two years ago and started writing. Um, and then uh, in November, um, uh, November 2019, I had a very, very bad accident. I managed to fell backwards down as a, an outdoor staircase and landed with my head at the kitchen end and my legs up at the street end of the stairs. Anyway, amongst other things, I broke my neck. And uh, it's, I'm very, very lucky to survive. I had a wonderful surgeon who and to operate on successfully on me. And as you can see, I'm alive and kicking. But uh, it took, uh, well, a good two months out of my life. And then um, in February last year, uh, I started writing again. Then we had COVID and the lockdown. And I spent uh, you know, the best part of the lockdown uh, writing this book. And of course, it was ideal because there was nothing much else to do, except, of course, I've still not tidied my house, my flat. I've still not thrown things out. I've not done 
all the things that are most sensible people are doing during this period. But uh, anyway, I managed to get the book in more or less on time. And uh, I've been uh, extremely lucky uh, with my result and my editor there, who was very encouraging throughout so you're one of the few people the lockdown helped you to write a book i think <laughs> yes. it's funny because we did a conversation with another right gabriel yosipovici a few months ago and he also produced a book in lockdown so there will be lots of creative uh, things coming out of this lockdown probably um uh, Hella, Fergal Keen in today's Guardian describes you as a doyen of the diplomatic press corps. And he also writes, quote, that you brought the intellectual hunger and moral purpose of one who escaped the catastrophe that descended on Europe in the 1930s. And I wanted to ask you whether you agree with this and how do you think your own experiences have shaped your journalistic career? Well, I think, first of all, he's been over generous in his praise. I must say, Fergal, he always is extraordinarily kind, and, but I think also quite perceptive. <laughs> I don't, it's very difficult to, to answer your question on how my, my background influenced the underlying theme of the book throughout, because one of the points that I, I tried to make from the beginning to the end was, and which also, of course, is reflected in its title, is the fact that I've always felt insecure. I've always felt the need to prove myself. I've never thought that I've done well enough. And uh, it was, and I personally uh, uh, link all this to the fact of having been unrooted, I'm oh, sorry, uprooted at a very, at an early age, having to adjust obviously to a different life, new language, everything new and different. And even though I am very adaptable, I've always realized that right at the back of my mind there is this feeling of being uprooted of, of never quite belonging to the place wherever I am. And always trying to escape from myself and from the realization that there is something insecure in my existence. And even though Yes, I mean, Fergal is very complimentary about my achievements, but of course, I don't think I was the doyen of the foreign press court, certainly at the time when he met me. But even so, of course, I know that I have been somewhat of an achiever in what I've done, and I've learned a lot. And yes, I've, I've you know, made friends all over the world with all sorts of people, and all of this. Uh, anyone looking at this from the outside would say, what a wonderful life. But I was the one that I knew that knew, it, which is balanced through the book, all this time and again, the need to prove myself to myself and to others, and always wanting to be loved more than people probably wanted to love me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm putting this rather bluntly. <laughs> no, I think I think you also in um, in our interview, which we did, you said, qu I quote you from your own interview, I'm totally convinced that the fact of having been uprooted have left a lasting impact and this creates a certain degree of insecurity which never leaves you. And that's what you, resonates very much in the book. Um, but my thinking is it's, on the one hand, it's the insecurity of a refugee, but maybe in your case also the curiosity for other cultures and the ability to adapt to other cultures. Oh, there you are, absolutely true. <clears throat> I mean, I'm, well, I've always wanted to discover new things. I've, oh, sorry. <clears throat> My, um, I've always been interested in, in learning about new societies. And of course, I've been very, very interested in politics and in international affairs. And the longer I wrote about it, uh, the more I enjoyed it and found it interesting and continue to be interested. I mean, nothing has changed with respect to that. And of course, again, uh, we hadn't mentioned this before, but after I left The Guardian and 
I wrote the two books that you mentioned earlier, but then of course I went to, off to work for George Weidenfeld, and it wasn't just China, it was much more. I mean, my, my main job really, what all had to do with various conferences uh, that uh, George Weidenfeld's Institute uh, was running. And, uh, well, one of them was a club of three, when we were back running media conferences in Germany and, and with China, we did uh, media exchanges. So there was a lot of variety. I met a completely new series of very interesting people through, thanks to George Feigenfeld. And it took me, it still left me with one small foot or a hand on the media scene, but at the same time also introduced me to a much wider political uh, scenario in different circumstances, not as a journalist, but as a conference organizer and participant. Mm -hmm. In 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 term in context of Lord Weidenfeld, you also write about your um, the Jewish identity and your sort of journey to your own Jewish identity. And maybe can you tell us a little bit about that and how it your Jewish journey relates to your refugee journey as well? Yes. Well. I come from a secular background. My mother was a, was a confirmed atheist in her religious outlook, if I can put it that way, rather stupidly. Um, I myself, as a, as a child, worked as a day, uh, day student in a boarding school of predominantly middle class uh, children from obviously. Um, Church, and certainly, I don't think I was probably the only Jewish child in the whole church. And um, I, um, I, uh, for a long time, I could neither bring myself to acknowledge that I was Jewish, or even, you know, I, when, if my mother talked about German in the, in the open, I would scream at her and say, talk English. You know? And uh, I just didn't want to know anything about my past or anything, you know, just getting away from it. But gradually, of course, I came to realize that uh, I am Jewish and I've got to reach the point where, first of all, I could acknowledge this to other people who probably knew it anyway, but I had to be able to say that I was Jewish. And that took me a long time, but it was, Really, only when I started um, working on the Simon Wiesenthal biography, I was thrown right into all his activities, and of course, he had, like he lived with the Holocaust as a, as a daily phenomenon in his life, and I spent a lot of time in Vienna talking with him while I was writing the book. And so it forced me to face up much more to my beliefs and who I am and what I was doing. And I think it slowly, gradually brought me back to thinking more closely about what it is to, to be and do. And then of course, working with George Weidenfeld, all of that intensified partly because of his commitment to Israel partly because of its determination to fight anti-Semitism. So overall, I was much more, it, it became part of my life, finally, that I would didn't only acknowledge being Jewish, but didn't thinking much more about it. And to the large extent now, regretting that because of my so whole backstory of my childhood education, that I, I've never been sufficiently wrapped into Jewish culture. And uh, you know, it's a bit late to start catching up on that now, but I'll try. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hella, Hella we, now is the time to talk about it. The, when you, the circumstances, when you came on the kinder transport and you know, your life then and, and in the Lake District and uh, what happened to you? Well, as I'm sure some of, some of our friends know, if you were a woman refugee on your own in 
the passing the tone, but uh, that's what I'm feeling. But Hela, I think the, the, what we found actually the two things. First of all, you know, your mother's domestic experience, which so many other women had. And also one forgets that there were parents who had children who couldn't take their children. You were in a way lucky to be with your mother. But the issue of schooling and that the initial family didn't want to pay on for the schooling. That's, right. that's something we found in the archive. Tell us a little bit about yes, that. That's right, because um, when uh, I think when I was 15, uh, because under the sort of arrangements for the kinder transport children, the family who took them on when they arrived were financially responsible for them during their school years. And when I was 15, uh, we, my adoptive parents, who they were called Infield, uh, wrote to my mother to say that as I would uh, soon be reaching my 16th birthday, they would cease to pay the fees for the school. Uh, and they felt that it was time for me to start earning my living and that I should take a short secretarial course and become a secretary and um, go out into the world. This was, of course, still on during the war. Um, uh, I was absolutely aghast because I wanted to, you know, to stay on, and of course, I, might, I wanted to be able to go to university. And uh, my mother clearly supported this. And into this, sorry, this is a sort of rather complicated story because the school where I was was actually the feeder school of a teacher training college called the Charlotte Mason College which was next door uh, to the school itself. And the head of the teacher training college then proposed that they would pay my fees to, to I don't know, to, to complete my schooling. Um, provided I then took the teacher training course and you know, with the, um, the object of becoming a teacher. <laughs> and, I was pretty determined already at that age and knew what I wanted and what I didn't want. And I absolutely, totally against becoming, I knew that I would never be a good teacher. I didn't want to be a teacher. I wanted to go to university. But uh, somehow we uh, managed to draw a veil over that and for a while. That, sorry. <clears throat> That was the point at which the headmistress uh, offered to buy the school books as a way of helping them to stay on. And then I think I also got the refugee organizations to agree to pay my schooling for another two years. And that is how I managed to stay on. But when I then informed the, teacher, the head of the teacher training college that I did not intend to become a teacher, uh, they were very, very rude about me, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. and, but they couldn't, they couldn't get me, couldn't get rid of me in school, <laughs> and I didn't manage to get into everything instead. <laughs> mm. Because in a way, uh, you know, your generation of of kinder, their in, their schooling was often interrupted because they didn't have a mother to fight for them, or you know, nobody could fight for their education. Okay, I, I know I was extraordinarily lucky in so many ways, and uh, yes, I mean, so it did help that I was doing quite well at the school, I think. Mm -hmm. But, but Hela, in, in your book, you also have a lovely picture, actually, of some refugees in the Lake District, which is, I'm yes. going to show it. It's this picture. Maybe tell us a little bit about this. It's this picture here. Yes, it's that picture, yes. Well, uh, there, was there were group. some other refugees there. <laughs> there was a group of refugees in the Lake District. Um, that uh, included um, um, Hans Keller, who uh, became very well known afterwards, who came there after he, had, uh, he managed, managed to, to get to, to Britain. And he had um, an, um, an aunt there who married to an Englishman, to what must have been a wonderful Englishman who had not only brought out 
his, his wife's family from Austria, but also various other relatives, and including a very famous um, doctor who was also a violinist called Adler. And together, there were various musicians there. They formed a little um, chamber music um, group and gave private concerts. And I remember my first time, first times I listened to Beethoven and Schubert chamber music was in these refugee, little refugee concerts. And the picture that you see there is, was a group of various refugees. I mean, there weren't that many, but always met from time to time. Unfortunately, my mother is not on that photograph, and I am looking quite large, but nevertheless, I think the youngest on that, on that picture. But um, I, I should say that at school, I was sometimes called not Heller, but Heller fan. <laughs> See, I was, I was quite large then, but I think I slipped down very quickly. <laughs> And Hella, what about language? How did you manage with English? Did you, I mean, did, did, did people ask you whether you're a refugee or could you pretend to be English at that point? I don't think I could pretend to be English, but they didn't ask me whether I was English. <laughs> no, I think I must have spoken. To, uh, so I, I had one term of school in London before the Lake District uh, adventure. And I found the school report from that, and I was clearly speaking, I must have learned English very, very quickly indeed. But I refused to speak in German for a long time, and it was only, my school had one male teacher, all the others were women, and of course, every girl had a, what they call a pash on him, <laughs> and that included me, and he was very stern with me. He said, look, German is your mother tongue, and you've got to stop refusing to speak it. You've got to get back to it. And of course, because I was so numb, <laughs> I decided I'd better just start learning German for his sake. <laughs> but I didn't win his love. <laughs> it is not enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, that, but that's how I came back to it. But, but you know, the thing, the fact is that you know, from from, 90, from the summer of 1939 onwards, I was speaking English all the time. And uh, it took me quite a while to learn to speak German, which in a way, you know, <laughs> was a bit, I regret because it meant I didn't read enough in German at that time. And I sometimes think my vocabulary is, is smaller than it should be. Mm -hmm. And this brings me actually to the next topic of identity, what I was, what did I want to discuss with you. You have actually taken Austrian citizenship and you've written two books, of course, which required an engagement with Austrian politics, which is Simon Wiesenthal and the book on, uh, on a guilty victim. Um, but for many years, you were also the British voice on the German television program, uh, Frühschoppen, hosted by Werner Höfer, which I actually vividly remember. Some other people might remember that program. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what, what is your relationship today to Germany and Austria? And did your own personal background also play a role when you worked as a journalist in Germany and Austria? Or was that your own background kind of pushed to the side in some way? I think it made it, my background in many ways made it easier and not more difficult. And I didn't push it back. I mean, I've never hidden who I am or where I come from. So, um, I went back to Austria very soon after the, after the war. In fact, as soon as I had, uh, I'd, I'd acquired British nationality and had British passport, because my mother, who for various reasons, which I explained in the book, was reluctant to go back at that point, um, wanted to know if there was anything left of, of our possessions and, and the art, and you know, wanted me to just go back. Go and have a look. <laughs> and uh, so I went into the war ravage yeah, uh, um, quite early on. And um, I felt it I felt it easy in, my, in Austria fairly quickly. I mean, I regarded myself 
as a tour, I mean, principally as a tourist, and obviously as a visitor, not. And it took me a long time before I felt that, yes, you know, I have, my, I have an Austrian identity. I'm not just a visitor of Britain who's always in Austria. But that took a while. But, but, it, uh, but once it was there, I've taken it as an absolute natural, you know, when I arrived in Austria, uh, I'm in, in that sort of identity mode as well as the rest of my identities. Um, with Germany, it took me longer to come to terms with its history, with its past. With Austria, I didn't give it enough thought until much later what Austria had been done, perpetrated. All I knew about Austria that I did not share the view of obviously many other refugees who felt that Austria was so anti Semitic that you could never set foot in the country again. Um, I, fortunately, my mother didn't bring, bring me up to have that view, she didn't have it, and I never got it. So I came with a much more open mind to see how I felt about Austria. With Germany, my mind was not as open. And I always trace it back to my first meeting with Willy Brandner, which gave me, uh, oddly enough, an opportunity to have a very long discussion with him about Germany, about his own movies, about my past, about the Holocaust, a big mishmash of things all related to what Germany was and is and how it is coming to terms with its history. And through that friendship, uh, I developed a much greater understanding for Germany and really came to appreciate and enjoy what Germany had achieved, the way it was tackling its its well, in the Holocaust, it's passed much more deeply, much more effectively, both in education and in the way people were adapting than the Austrians. No question about that. And I've come to see Germany as a, as a model post-war democracy, and in many ways, it has certain virtues that Britain today does not have. And um, I'm comfortable in Germany and have many friends now in Germany. And uh, through George Weidenfeld, who himself had very close links with Germany, um, I came in closer and, and met an extraordinary number of interesting uh, Germans, thanks to him, and um, made some really very close friends indeed. So uh, I feel good about Germany and people. Um, it is a country that um, I like to visit them to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I may, I may sound I'm, I'm, may sound a little bit defensive because I know not everybody shares that too. <laughs> but but well, let's, uh, let's but, see what people have to say later. But um, Ella, you also write about your frustration in the book with Brexit which made you question parts of your British identity. Um, and I wanted to ask you a bit cheekily because we all had to fill in the census yesterday. <laughs> so I had my own struggles with that. If I may ask, what did you fill out in the section on identity and on religion? And do you think, for example, that some survivors and refugees would have refused to list their religion? Because I can definitely say my mother, who was a survivor, would have just blankly refused to fill out the section on religion. How did you feel about it? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not sense. quite sure that I've understood. You mean, have you, did why you have don't to... I deny my Jewish past? No, the census. I don't know whether you had to... Oh, feel... the census. Oh, sorry. So I wanted to ask <laughs> you what you filled out on your identity section and whether yes. you filled out the religion or you felt, should one answer that question? I filled it in as Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, I did think about it. Um, what I hadn't realized, what I, 
which I really regret now, is that where you are asked about your uh, nationality or your affiliation, you could say European. <laughs> I mean, I would, I just, you know, I just didn't grasp the, <laughs> the possibility of doing that, and you know, put down British, but with some hesitation, <laughs> which again is unfair. No, I, you know, Brexit. I mean, well, obviously, I, I really feel my identity is, is, is European. And it's, it's, um, much more than it is British Brexit. And, but I think what shocked me most of all is, is not that it's been a, a, a mega issue, but that people readily fall for the superficial arguments that are advanced uh, in support of Brexit. But, but, that the British people, on the whole, still have this very narrow definition of uh, nationhood, of uh, sovereignty, uh, some complete misunderstanding of the modern world in which we live, and a misunderstanding of the cultural heritage that this country has. This, mm -hmm. this concept of uniqueness and differentiation from Europe is something that has been the fact that it's been so widely accepted uh, has came as a surprise <laughs> mm -hmm. and I just don't feel part of that. And uh, you know, some people say this is ingratitude and uh, have to have to be thankful that Britain in the home allowed you to integrate in this society, and therefore, you know to question the we interpret our definition of nationhood. But I have to question it. I just uh, it alienates me in some way on mm -hmm. And Hella, have you got, I think we should open the floor now fairly soon, but maybe just the final, have you, have you got a message for future generation based on your experience, your own personal experience, and of course your experience in you know interviewing all these all the world <laughs> and being a witness to the united nation to so many other things anything else you want <laughs> that, that's another book <laughs> no uh, goodness I'm, I, I don't know that i'm important enough to have a message but you know I, I, my, my message would obviously be first of all have an open mind don't have a closed mind uh, understand that in most people's lives there's a struggle between different identities but try and find out what your priorities are which is very important i think try to be outgoing in, in work work in a way that you're able to win people's trust and uh, be interested in the world and the world beyond your immediate confines. And I think this would be the, the kind of philosophies that I would uh, suggest people might reflect on. Okay, Hela, thank you so much. In fact, the first question has come up and that was a question I had prepared, but there wasn't. <laughs> I'm grateful to Jacqueline Hobson, who asked, you've been, or comments that you've been a remarkable trailblazer as a woman journalist, and in what way has your gender shaped your life as a Jewish refugee and a journalist? And she says, you know, men normally don't confess to insecurity. So I think she applauds you here. So question, how did gender shape your life? Um, it gave me a lot, I think, in work-wise, it gave me quite a few advantages, simply because when I started working, I was one of I was rather a rare species. There were not many women journalists uh, writing about politics and above all about foreign affairs as I was doing. And by being a woman amongst men, because you know, other journalists were all men, um, people remembered me more easily. Uh, you know, I, there was just one of me, or maybe two or three of us, 
but there weren't a multitude of us. So I think it gave me, in terms of my work, it certainly gave me certain advantages. Uh, in terms of my personal life, um, I think uh, it helped and it hindered it. It allowed me to, to meet an extremely interesting number of people. Uh, it, it allowed me to develop relationships in a way that was slightly different, perhaps in many ways, to <laughs> just purely male or purely female relationships. But I think it also taught me much more about what it is to be a minority. Uh, and a minority, not just as a journalist, but a minority as a Jew and a minority as a foreigner uh, in, a, in, in a new country. So there are lots of aspects to this, but on the whole, and I've said that in my book, I regret that I didn't use the advantages that I had as a woman journalist to help other, to, to associate myself more closely with the rest of the, the other women journalists who were much more active in establishing equality for men and women in journalism. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of thought, I don't think I actively thought about it, but I realize now that my contribution was to be the kind of role model in what I was doing, but certainly not a role model in what I was doing by way of working with other women journalists to promote the new generations that were coming up. And of course, today, uh, we fortunately have many, many more women working in journalism and in media. Uh, and my time, and uh, I admire particularly the many women who have the courage to go into war zones, which I never did, and which I turned down when I had the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank That's you. Not you at all. <laughs> Thank you, Lev. It's very interesting. I mean, more to say, but there's another question that's coming, a comment from Claire Mali to say uh, thank you for your very interesting introduction to your life and work. I'd love to know what inspired you first to become a writer. Were you a big reader as a child in Austria? Did you ever read children's book by Else Uri? Or was it issues rather than the medium of writing that first appealed to you? I'm afraid something much more pedestrian movies to journalism, <laughs> which uh, of course meant writing, and simply that I was looking for a job. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, I had my first work, my first paid work, had been in um, market research. And uh, I was quite good at what I was doing, but I was doing market research partly for an organization which no longer exists, uh, called the Colonial Development Corporation, which had a famous groundnut scheme, which in history has gone down as one of British government's great mistakes. And um, but I uh, I knew and I didn't like a, a sort of nine to five office job and I wanted out and I started looking for other jobs and one day answered an advertisement in Statesman for a commercial editor for a paper called West Africa. Because I'd done some market research on West Africa, I thought, well, I could apply for that. And I did, and I got the job. And that's how I got into journalism. It wasn't that it would be my ambition or my intention. It just happened. And then I discovered um, that uh, I was quite good at writing, which <laughs> obviously you have to do with your reporting. And um, I found sort of early pieces that I wrote at that time um, on very important subjects like the Cooper Prize and uh, discovered that then, right at the very beginning, I was writing quite fluently and, and not at all badly. So, you know, I must have been fairly, well, I can't say gifted, but certainly qualified to write. And uh, I've always enjoyed writing. But of course, journalism is not the same thing as book writing. And uh, I didn't get to, to 
actually writing the book up until um, many years after I'd become a journalist. But um, I have found it relatively easy. Well, of course, I'm never satisfied with what I've written. <laughs> but um, again, but it, it was not that I, I felt that I was destined to be a writer at any point. So it just sort of happened. Luck, I mean, luck plays a Mark has played a, a great role but in my life, and to, I think many other people would say the same thing about them. Thank you, Hella. Um, one more question here uh, from Mick Gold, saying you, you say you now admire Germany's mature democracy. What is your feeling about post-war Austria? Well, I think it's, um, it, it, it certainly is a democracy but with many faults, and uh, I'm sure the question of everybody else is aware of the fact that it, it, it has, it has had for decades, a very strong far-right party, which at the moment is actually weaker than it's been for some time, but uh, certainly not an ideal democracy. And unfortunately, the Social Democrats in Austria are very weak at the moment, partly through very faulty leadership. But uh, I think, I, I, I do not think that the far right movement in Austria is ever going to dominate the, the country again, to an extent that you can really control the country. Okay. Um, any more messages? Uh, I have a personal oh, message here um, from, can't see the name actually, LP. It's somebody uh, who thinks he might be a cousin from your father's side and he wants to connect with you. Um, so that's interesting. He wants to say hello and uh, learn a bit more. So I can say, I, sorry, I can't see the name of the person. So please. Um, you can email me and I will pass it on to Hella. My email, I'm going to put my email now in the chat and then you can email me. Hella, there might be some family trying to connect to you, so that's interesting. Well, there, there were an awful lot of pics in Austria, <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> okay, I've just um, um, posted my, my email. Um, any other questions? I don't see anything at the moment. What I what wanted to ask you, Hella, is also now um, you, in the last few years, you have been very active in uh, supporting and fundraising for the Sussex Weidenfeld Institute of Jewish Studies. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about it and yeah, why is it important to you? Right. <laughs> well, um, I assume so, some, some of our, our participants um, know, are aware that there's something called the German Jewish Studies Center at the Sussex University. Um, I've been on the advisory board of the German Jewish Studies Center for some years. And, uh, and, uh, and, and George Weinkel was always the lifetime president of this group, even though he didn't take a very active part in it. And he, um, me, he, well, one of his um, projects was to establish professors of uh, Israel studies in Britain's leading universities. He succeeded in getting one chair uh, into Oxford, and he then uh, had donations from a number of small group of people to uh, prepare to fund a second uh, professorship. And I suggested that as we had this link, sorry, I should have said the German Jewish Study Center is based on the Sussex University. And so I suggested uh, that this money that was available to fund another chair in Israel studies should be offered to Sussex University. And uh, that in fact uh, took some while, but it happened and Sussex then acquired 
a professorship in, in Israel studies who was part of the history department uh, at Sussex University. Mm -hmm. And out of the blue, Sussex University, I mean, not to me, out of the blue, uh, Sussex University decided it wanted to establish an, an institute of Jewish studies in the university and call it the Weinfeld Institute. Sadly, George Weinfeld died just before that decision was taken. However, I, I was really very happy because I knew that was the kind of thing that he would have wanted. It was just the kind of thing. And so I decided I would do everything I could to help establish it and uh, to help above all with the fundraising. And uh, one of the things that we achieved quite early on was to persuade the German government, and particularly Mrs. Merkel, whose decision it was, to Germany to fund a professorship in this new Institute of Biological Studies, initially for five years and maybe for longer. And we now have a professor who's been appointed. And uh, I continue to do my best to help with the fundraising, which on the present circumstances, as you can understand, it, is not very easy. Um, the Austrian government has also funded uh, some uh, important project that the Institute has, uh, is working on and is likely to fund another one, which is linked uh, to the decisions of so many ex Austrians to reapply for them their Austrian passports and to, to establish more clearly, to analyze more clearly what the motivation of that is. I think that's an important project and uh, I mm -hmm. hope it will be funded. Well, this is for the, the second generation who is now eligible to apply. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. wasn't eligible to apply until recently. Yes, yeah. Hella, one more question came up. Uh, from Lillian Levy, what do you think about the future of Germany post Merkel era? Huh. If we all knew that, <laughs> I, I mean, anybody's guess is, is, I mean, my guess is, is as good as anyone else's. It's obviously very uncertain. But she will be missed enormously, not just in Germany, but on the European stage. And she's already largely absent on the European stage, which is very, I mean, not good at the moment, given the problems that he has. But I mean, clearly, uh, Germany will continue as a democracy, but uh, its leadership uh, is different. And whether Germany, I mean, it's, it's totally unclear at the moment who will really emerge as her successor. Uh, two or three candidates now, because the candidate chosen by the CDU. Um, it's no longer certain that he could be actually be able to do it because the CDU has done so badly in the neutral elections uh, two weeks ago. And we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But it, it won't be the same job in history. I mean, things will change. And, uh, I just hope they won't be for the worse. Okay, thank you, Hannah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I can't see any other questions. So uh, it's just up to me to say thank you to our audience for coming. Thank you, Hella, really for giving us the time. You're going to be very, very busy, I'm sure, in the next few days. Um, the book is out. You can, uh, we, we checked it. There were 10 copies on Amazon, so it must have sold out, but uh, it's with other <laughs> sellers. <laughs> I hope it will sell out again. <laughs> We're it's sure going to be a bestseller with so many reviews you already had. I'm sure there'll be more coming. So really thank you, Hella, uh, for being with us today. Well, thank you. And good luck. Pleasure. And thank you, everyone else. And have a good evening. And see you again soon.